I keep putting videos on my second channel and on sites away from YouTube because I don't like the conditions in my place. As you can probably hear, the construction has gotten worse. You thought it was bad last year when I had to manipulate the audio. It's a lot worse now. But I won't be manipulating the audio because it takes too much time. And when I play this back, if it's especially insane in terms of low quality, I'll upload this on the other channel as well, not my main channel. But if it's bearable, I'll upload it to the main channel. And if it does go on the main channel, I have to announce right now that I've been uploading videos on my second channel. I usually don't plug that channel because, well, anyone who cares enough is going to find out anyway because it's posted on my channel wall on the main channel. Um, but I will take the time to plug it in this video because I'm subscribed to it on the main channel and yet its videos don't show up in my subscriptions. And a couple of people on Skype saw it, but a couple of other people on Skype didn't see it. So I don't know what's going on with the subscription box, but my own second channel that I'm subscribed to on my main channel is not displaying the videos that I uploaded on that second channel. So if you want to see what I've been doing last, I think, week and a half, two weeks, you can feel free. I'll link the videos in the crotch bar. As for this video, I've got a few things. I, I think I have a few things. It may be a bit chaotic. We'll see how it goes. Um, I left a comment earlier today that I want to read out because I often leave these decent comments and I never read any of them in video form. And whatever I do upload in video form, it's just mediocre by comparison because, well, you get to structure things better in written form. So, uh, someone asked me about Jordan Peterson. Of course, the last video on this channel is about Peterson. That was like two and a half months ago. Um, so, in keeping with that, I've watched a lot of his stuff since then, even more so than I had before. And it's just this weird quasi-inspirational stuff. At best, it is, uh, he, he's, he's wise beyond anyone's interpretation, or at least any, any analytic philosophers interpretation that's the best case scenario worst case scenario is he is Deepak Chopra in wolves clothing and I gave him the benefit of the doubt for a long time but now I'm leaning toward Chopra 2.0 it's probably not a good thing for me to make these kinds of accusations right now because a lot of people that are swindled by him um, him and his audience are still in that sort of honeymoon phase because he's, he's still relatively new. Um, and I find that it's best to wait for that honeymoon phase to pass and then people are gonna be a lot more receptive to criticisms. Although I'm not exactly being diplomatic in my criticisms by calling him Chopra 2.0. So I'll take that hit because, well, that's just the way my mind works. I, I try to be constructive at all times, but it doesn't always work. Probably doesn't work half the time. Uh, but I will read out this comment. Someone asked me, because he does, again, like I said, he does this weird quasi-inspirational stuff. He gives these sort of pep talks. And it's always what you should do to beat procrastination, right? So it's the, the all-encompassing you. You should find a partner who challenges you. You should clean your room every day, blah, 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 this and that. It's like, well, who is this all-encompassing you? Right, this is why all these advice schemes, is what I call them, uh, make no sense. If you see an advice video and you see the word you, red flag right off the bat. Can't believe I have to point this out. But anyway, someone asked about those kinds of pep talks and how he, he's one of the people who, who rails against nihilism. He's using a non-technical sort of colloquial application of nihilism, but no one is nihilistic in that sense. To be nihilistic in that sense is to not exist. So I'm just gonna read out this comment here. Uh, I don't think motivation for personal stuff hinges on one's answers to life's grand questions or anything of the sort. 
motivation for impersonal stuff, stuff like ideological agendas. Now that does factor into those answers to a greater extent, but certainly not to an all-encompassing extent. That's an agenda-based epistemic clash, not a what should I do with my life-based epistemic clash. These are very different things. You can believe that you can be an epistemic pessimist and still find a motivation to do every last thing you want in your own life, to fulfill every last goal. There's absolutely no connection to your epistemic status. I'll continue the comment. I should probably shouldn't interrupt myself as I'm reading the comment, goddammit. I should probably just read it in one fell swoop. <sighs> Peterson does a horrible job of keeping the two separated. He thinks people's denial of cosmic purpose or grandiosity demotivates them inherently. I don't see any evidence of that. Demotivation on a personal level has more to do with type A versus type B personalities or any other personality cluster. Um, how motivated someone is to achieve their own personal goals has far more to do with natural endowments and psychological profiles than it does with any given epistemic status. Peterson also uses the word meaning annoyingly. Like, if I care about something with enough intensity, then my life has meaning. Whereas if I only mildly care about the things I care about, my life lacks meaning? No, it doesn't work that way. Everyone cares about something. Meta-level nihilists care about stuff, passionately. But Peterson lumps meta and folk nihilisms into the same pile. Any talk of folk nihilism inevitably reminds me of satanic panic and things of that nature, that sort of fear-mongering. Like, you hear this every now and then nowadays, like, oh, consumeristic Western nihilism, right? So because the, the, the person who is taken in by consumerism doesn't care about the things you care about, you get to call them nihilistic. Not wrong, not misled, but nihilistic. I don't think it works that way. You are abusing language. And you know who you are. People I challenge on various blogs, whom I also link to my videos, you can feel free to show up here and defend that point. <sighs> there is no folk nihilism. Not for individuals with functioning brains, because just maintaining one's brain functionality disqualifies folk nihilism. This very rant I'm engaging in exemplifies why meaningfulness and meaninglessness needs to be removed from the lexicon. I've never seen these words add any clarity to any conversation. It's so fucking true. Existential philosophy is supposed to clarify this, but it just muddies the water even more. Because existentialists also have a habit of sort of fast and loose, going from one definition to the other. Cosmic meaning, notional meaning. Mind-dependent meaning, mind-independent meaning. Totally defeats the purpose of using the word in the first place. We can always just say, I care about things. And caring about things with intensity 1 versus intensity 100, that's still either meaningful or meaningless. The extent to which you care about something, the, the degree to which you're willing to go to actualize those goals you have that you care about, that is not going to change the categorical status of meaningfulness and meaninglessness. Yet people think it's a gradient. And it's annoying because it's sloppy. So, uh, to finish off the comment, but about personal demotivation and procrastination, which Jordison gives people advice on, um, I wrote, I prefer Carlin's overview to most anyone else's. And Carlin said, show me someone who is doing the couch potato thing, and I'll show you someone who is not causing any fucking trouble. And then I say, I just love that. But workaholics and assorted go-getters find it offensive. And Peterson tells them what they want to hear. So I thought that was a decent comment. I probably should have read it in one fell swoop instead of just interrupting myself. But hey, that's just the way it goes. 
Um, so yeah, I find uh, I should probably play some of Peterson's videos again in in the future because it's um, it's a lot of young males, early twenties, late teens, things of that nature, saying that it's just eye opening the stuff he tells them. It's eye opening this, eye opening that, and I think that they're also just taken in by this inability to differentiate motivation when it comes to ideological agenda, which makes perfect sense if you are a epistemic pessimist or some sort of radical skeptic who believes that knowledge is just simply out of our reach, it would make sense to be demotivated when it comes to being willing to stake your life on the line for your agenda, because you can't really be all that confident that your agenda is airtight. But I still despise this um, waffly attitude, uh, blending of the impersonal agenda when it comes to hard-fought analytic items with the personal agenda. Just whatever the fuck we want to do, whatever the fuck we want to attain with our own lives, the extent to which we're able to truly know things in the thick sense of the term knowledge is just totally irrelevant. So procrastination and things of that nature, it's more, it more has to do with what personality type are you? Are you type A personality or are you type B? Do you like to work hard and play hard? Or do you like to just take it easy all around? And there's nothing wrong with taking it easy all around. I can't tell you how many people have seized the opportunity and ended up complaining about the fact that, well, they just ended up getting themselves in a bunch of do or die situations and they probably should have just stayed home far more often than they did. But we never hear those counterexamples. We always hear the stories about the people who just sat on their ass and ended up regretting it. And there needs to be a bit of a balance act there. We need to also. Um, we need to also relay the stories of people who were way too outgoing, way too much of a social butterfly, way too adventurous, and it ended up biting them in the ass. So please, you people who are just bamboozled by Peterson, who's telling you you should be go-getters and things of that nature, understand that, that that might be the thing for you, but understand the other side of the coin also exists. I cannot tell you how many people I've run into who had horror story after horror story after horror story and then I would ask them, well, why do you think these horror stories keep happening to you and yet I have so few of them? And then I ask them, how often are you compelled to put yourself in the center of something? And they tell me, well, just about all the time. Well, that might just be your problem. You get bored easily. There's certain people who get bored easily. They need to do stuff. I'm at a point where not only don't I have to do something, in order to not be bored ever, but I don't even have to read anything in order to not be bored. I can stave off boredom without the internet, without books. I can just be in an empty room and think, and I will not be bored, probably for hours on end, and hell, maybe even days on end. And it is the sort of people who are not content with merely experiencing things vicariously. They think they have to be at the epicenter of whatever the fuck is going on. Those are the types who think Peterson and, and, and gurus of that nature, and yes, I will call him a guru, um, psychological guru. Um, they think he's got the itch for their scratch, but it's just not the case. And you'll find out the hard way, as I've met, I've encountered many people who have found out the hard way. Reach for the sky. That's the advice. Reach for the sky. Win, lose, or draw. Reach for the sky. Well, if loss results in quicksand, there's going to be a certain level of potential um, wishing that you can buy back the decision. So, if I saw Peterson make that point in at least one video, I wouldn't be harping on this right now. But I've never seen the point made. The point is always the converse. <laughs> It's the, oh, I should turn off the audio here. It's the problem of 
not having seized the day and what could have been and of course the what could have been is always framed as a you missed out on something positive but it could just as easily be the case that by procrastinating by being a couch potato you averted catastrophe no one can truly guarantee which way any given couch potato's life could have gone had they not been a couch potato, but it's worth highlighting that it's not a one-sided counterfactual. The counterfactual is two-sided. So, that's, uh, that's what I have to say in terms of that. I also, there was a video that I wanted to respond to, but I don't have it uh, handy here at my fingertips, so I'm just going to have to paraphrase it. Um, the user, the happy antinatalist, did a response video to Chris Cornell's suicide. And I thought about leaving a comment, but then I thought, well, you know what, I'm doing a mixed bag video, so I might as well make the bag even more mixed than it is. So she, she starts off pointing out how she believes, she quotes uh, one of these negative liberty philosophers, uh, borderline <laughs> voluntarists, and she talks about how the freedom to choose is not worth a damn unless it is the freedom to choose wrongly. And that's the high-mindedness of the point, is that you have the freedom to choose wrongly. And then she applies it to the suicide case. But of course, that's a case where the wrongness of the choice has a spillover, because she was complaining about, I'll link to the video, she was complaining about the fact that the spillover negative, uh, negatively impacted Chris Cornell's kids. So it's not an intrapersonal wrong choice, it's an interpersonal wrong choice. So right there we're in trouble. But let's assume it was an inter, sorry, let's assume it was an intrapersonal wrong choice. Should individuals have the right to make choices that harm themselves and themselves only? And that ties back to the a uh, question of farsighted versus nearsighted preferences. Right? So your, your object level interests are interests in the here and now, your meta level interests are global in their scope. They affect you across your whole life. So what might cancel out the other? Which one might cancel out the other in any given case? Now, take take seatbelt laws. Technically, you can apply the high-mindedness of the only freedom to choose that's worth a damn is the freedom to choose wrongly. You can apply that to argue against seatbelt laws. But how many people who choose to not wear seatbelts, who are given the choice to make um, the, the, the wrong move, and then don't end up getting killed in a, in a fatal crash, but they have a near fatal crash. So they end up in the hospital, right? So they had the freedom to choose wrongly, but then in retrospect, they wish, because the accident was so brutal, they wish they could have had a do-over where the government does nudge them, or hell, even flat out forces them to wear a seat belt. So as far as I'm concerned, even if it's a 50-50 split or any other kind of split, like even if it's 80-20, or, or, or 90-10 in favor of those who have the near fatal crash, who sustain some kind of a grotesque injury, and who, in, in the wake of that injury, still are glad that they were given the freedom to choose wrongly. Even if they go on to conclude they chose wrongly, they're still have, they, they, they still think there's more value in them having been given that freedom. But then 10% of those near fatal victims victims of their own misjudgment in not applying the seatbelt, um, they actually wish they could have had a do-over. So whose interests am I going to side in in that case? I don't care how lopsided the split is, I'm always going to side with the interests of those who are severely harmed and who wish they could have had a do-over. So in that sense, it ties back to the issue in the previous video about segmenting hard paternalism and soft paternalism. So soft paternalistic policies aim for those individuals. You can sort of say parenthood is justified on those very grounds. 
parents always think that they are justified in grounding, in forcing kids to wear braces, in forcing kids to brush or do homework, and all just a host of these things, these micromanaging things, and they think it's justified because down the road there's the presumption that the kid will appreciate it because there's the presumption that the parent's psychological profile will be the kid's psychological profile. Now it's all guesswork, and that's one of the main problems of parenthood. Um, but be that as it may, in my hypothetical example here, we have the 10% who, let's just say as a guarantee, will, at least 10%, minimum 10%, will regret having been given the right to choose wrongly to wear a seatbelt. I'll side with them, because that, by, by doing so, we avert catastrophe. By siding with the 90%, we're not really doing it in order to avert catastrophe. We're just doing it because of some fundamental respect for autonomy, which is kind of a spooky value, right? It's never, it's never autonomy in and of itself that we want to respect. It is individuals who have a preference for their autonomy being respected over anything else. But I think you'll find very few people have a preference for autonomy being non-negotiable, no matter the circumstance. This is one of the reasons why collateral damage is justifiable under damn near any political philosophy. Even political philosophies that fetishize self-ownership and um, negative rights. Nothing in there says collateral damage during war, war times is always impermissible, because that would be insane. It would totally negate the whole point of going to war. Now, granted, it's, it's extraordinary circumstances, but what good is a philosophy that doesn't scale extraordinary circumstances into its main tenets? It's worth a damn. It's just like a moral theory that doesn't take care to march in lockstep with the implications of game theory is a worthless moral theory. If game theory makes it so that... Um, certain things in your moral philosophy become incomprehensible, like certain act types simply being impermissible no matter what, even if game theory makes those things just, just totally unworkable, that's a worthless moral theory. Uh, back to the uh, uh, Cornell suicide thing. So that's the first thing that sort of raised my suspicion is, is she starts out the video talking about how the right to choose is the right to choose wrongly and she applies it to Cornell's uh, ideally legal right to commit the suicide. Now we can all agree he should have had the legal right to commit suicide. He shouldn't have had to do it in this violent way. He should have been able to go for the assisted suicide thing by a physician's help. Um, so we can agree on that but then um, she takes it to the non-legal, simply moral level, and she talks about how it was the wrong thing to do because he had parental responsibilities. So it was just plain wrong. Right? It's, it's these people who conceptualize certain act types as being just plain wrong. And in this case, abandon me. Abandonment is just plain wrong, abandoning one's kids. Now, I am of the view that unless you have dozens upon dozens upon dozens of kids who will mourn your loss and who will feel abandoned and who will be left with a bunch of psychological baggage as a result of you having offed yourself, um, the sort of hell that you would be committing yourself to by continuing to live with the sort of severe depression that I think Cornell likely had. Um, yeah, unless it's just dozens upon dozens of kids whose collective summed up suffering you're aggre aggregating on one side, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a rational trade-off. It's not a rational trade-off when you know the kind of hell that man would be committing himself to if he were to live for an additional few decades. 
And there's also the assumption that the kids believe it's that they have been wronged more so than they would be wronging him had he stuck around for their interests, right? So you can always apply it in the other way as well. Do we have any evidence that they feel that they have been wrong? Now, I'm not saying that we have no evidence that they're hurt, but to automatically assume that because they're feeling hurt, that they would therefore go on to conclude that he should have stuck around in his personal hell for an additional couple of decades or however long he would have had till the end of his life, um, that seems flat out sadistic. Again, only, I can only entertain that as the trade-off if we're talking the psychological torment of dozens upon dozens of abandoned kids that he saw fit to birth and then abandon. And I think her point just totally underestimates the magnitude of suffering that a suicidal person, suicidally depressed person, and, and has probably already gone through up until this point, but would especially continue to go through as he continues aging. I don't see how it can make for a um, sensible trade-off to wear that cross just so you don't abandon your kids. And I also think this whole kids abandonment thing is kind of a product of um, media. I think kids are conditioned to think that something is wrong with them simply because their parent either ditches them or in this case commits suicide or things of that nature. Uh, there have been a lot of films and shows and songs written about it so we sort of prime kids into believing that this is a big deal. Just like you sort of, you know how when the toddler falls on their ass or, or even on their face and just does not cry at all. Does not have a negative reaction at all, oftentimes. But then the toddler looks, or maybe not the toddler, maybe like a one-year-old or something, but then looks up at mommy or daddy and mommy or daddy have this freaked out expression on their face and it is that expression on their face that makes the kid go, holy fuck, serious shit just went down. I fell, I better start weeping. And they start weeping. I think that's a sort of a, a microcosm example. Um, and I think it does extend to this whole abandonment thing. Mommy abandoned me, daddy abandoned me. Um, if we treated it as though it's no big deal, it wouldn't be a big deal. But we expose kids to all, all kinds of just sappy and, and, and sanctimonious literature even. It's even in literature, this abandonment thing. And so, of course, they just mimic what they've been exposed to. I can go on about that. So, no, I don't believe that Cornell, uh, he, would have, he would have wronged himself more than he wronged his kids had he stuck around. And of course, if you start with agent neutral theories of ethics, then wronging oneself is every bit as important as wronging others. The only way to say it's not is by indulging some kind of agent relative theory of ethics, which is stupid. Because then you sort of have to side either with selfishness being bad in and of itself, or selflessness being bad in and of itself, or vice versa, one of those things being good in and of itself, one of those things being bad in and of itself, and those things can never be morally informative in and of themselves. The most unfortunate human being in the history of humanity, focusing on their suffering and their suffering only, from an agent-neutral point of view, that makes perfect sense. That's their best way to reduce suffering in the world even if it means neglecting everyone else. And it doesn't really have to be the worst life ever lived. It can be pretty much anything that's substandard. If you're living a substandard life, it is morally appropriate and morally expedient for you to focus on your own life to the exclusion of everyone else's life. Especially in a society where everyone else already looks out for number one anyway. Whereas if you're one of the people living some of the best 
or one of the best lives, um, then you, you're the ideal candidate for reducing the misfortunes and injustices and, and ill being levels of those who are far worse off than you. So it's all about how well off you are and how badly off you are. It's not about selfishness and selflessness in and of itself. Right? So even if we say Cornell was selfish for the act type that is called suicide, the fact that it's a selfish act type is morally uninteresting. Just as a selfless act type is morally uninteresting. The worst off person in the world should not be indulging selfless act types. That's not a good way for them to reduce suffering in the world because they're, they're just worsening themselves off even more. It's really weird when antinatalists make these kinds of, oh, I don't want to say mistakes because if I say mistakes, then I'm just a pompous asshole. But I guess that's what I am, so I shouldn't shy away from it. <sighs> How many minutes has this been going on? Oh, over 30 minutes. There's going to be a little blip at the 30 minute mark. 30 minutes and like 15 seconds. This stupid camera does not let me record in one fell swoop for more than 30 minutes without cutting the damn thing. So I have to connect it after it's disconnected. It's really annoying. Did I have anything else to add? I think I did. There was this other thing I wanted to discuss. I just want to discuss this problem of fucking um, who gets traction on the internet? Because showing up once in a blue moon, you'd think that would be the sort of thing that would interest people the most. Because I know those are the people that I'm most interested to hear. Like when someone who doesn't upload routinely uploads, like those are the very first videos I'm eager to click on. But I'm also noticing that those are the videos that get the least amount of clicks. And people who just overindulge, who just feel the need to, are people who love to listen to themselves talk, right? People who upload dozens of hours a week, maybe sometimes more, um, they're the ones who get all the crowds. And that's interesting. Now, they're also more articulate on average than people who upload once in a blue moon because they're habituated to talking to the camera, so it's easier for them. And there's this grander problem of people mistaking articulation for insight. There's also the other problem of people mistaking novelty for profundity. But yeah, there's, there's these certain personality types, people who enjoy insisting upon themselves. And that's going to win you crowds. The more effectively you insist upon yourself and upon what you assert as true, the more you're willing to be repetitious about that on a daily basis, weekly basis, uh, the more polemically impressive you will be to uh, not just newcomers, but to, it seems, the majority of the internet that's intellectually inclined. Because it's a very uh, lightweight intellectualism. Oh, it's, um, it's a huge problem. I don't know if I should counter that by um, becoming part of the problem on that stylistic level or if I should do the high-minded thing and just keep uploading you know, once in a blue moon because you really do have to habituate yourself into this repetition in your face um, combative uh, you also have to be somewhat of a cheap shot artist I know in the last couple of years there's cheap shot artists that have really done well for themselves um, but then again, when you step away from YouTube, sympathy seekers also do very well for themselves too. So that's that sort of weird dichotomy. I guess that they, they bounce back off each other. Um, but it's all generic. It's all generic. So we have articulate vloggers who just, just total autopilot type videos no real consideration, no real capacity to pause, it seems. Just blurt out the headlines, blurt out the daily events, select the craziest stories that 
make a mockery of any political position because the worst adherents of that position will be highlighted. So we get into caricature politics. Very easy to do. There's the nadir fallacy, which is treating a given position or, or a given movement based on the worst members of that movement having overexposure. But then there's also the apex fallacy. And that's the insistence that a movement should be judged by the better or the bestest proponents of that movement. And we're nowhere near a sensible average wavelength. We're always either on the apex fallacy or the nadir fallacy. Proponents of a movement will insist on their own apex fallacy. They will want you to judge their movement based on their best co-travelers. And the outgroup will be, they'll, they'll recommend that you judge based on the worst co-travelers. So that's a problem. Um, oh, one of the things that uh, actually precipitated this rant is I can't, I, I'm catching myself focusing on the tediousness of the messenger more than on the harmfulness of the message. Now I know that's not a smart thing to do. I've been kind of disciplined about that over the last, oh, I don't want to say maybe five years, I've been very disciplined, always zeroing in on the harm ratio and not the retardation ratio. Because oftentimes the most retarded messengers are not going to be the ones peddling the most harmful message and vice versa. We shouldn't expect them to. It would be insane to expect them to, for everything to match up neatly and tidily. And then I always try to do my best to ignore stupidity and focus on, well, what's harmful, what has the most adherence while being harmful, and what has most uh, legislative power. So it's sort of the, the trifecto criteria. Um, and I've been very good at that, but as of late, I am finding myself battling very hard. I've got recorded videos where I'm just railing at stupid things that are not really all that harmful in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I'm probably committing that stupid fallacy that people call the fallacy of relative privation. Because when someone complains endlessly about a problem that I view as a trivial problem, um, I'll point out how I think it's a trivial problem, but then somebody will probably accuse me of committing that sort of fallacy. And that might make sense if we had endless time to solve the serious problems. But in reality, we don't have endless time. Every attentional bit of energy you devote to a trivial problem is one less second you would have otherwise devoted to a non-trivial problem. So the fallacy of relative privation is okay, yeah, it's technically a fallacy, but I don't see how you can just hand wave the point, the counterpoint I just made against it. I think in a lot of ways it does make more sense for us to sort of police um, grievances, right? So if your grievances is, is, are kind of frivolous, yeah, they're not 100% negligible, but I don't think there's anything intellectually uncouth with us saying, maybe you ought to focus on that instead. So those are the kind of people that really irk me as of late. And I shouldn't shy away from pointing that out. I shouldn't shy away from uploading some of the videos that I've shot just, just railing against them. Um, it all plays into my, my doing things that I know I shouldn't do. Like, I know I should never lurk any Twitter feed. I know I shouldn't do this. But like I said, one of the things that precipitated this video was I was on ContraPoint's Twitter feed and I browsed like two weeks worth of his tweets. And the guy is just complaining endlessly about creeping fascism, right? Nazism, more and more Nazi sympathizers. I'll, I'll, I'll leave a post showing why that's actually not the case um, and why these are still every bit as fringe groups as they were in the past. 
there's no significant uptick in sympathies to these things when it comes to the general population. But if you looked at his Twitter feed, you'd think that, yes, this, this really is creeping, right? So, so he's one of these people, Coughlin's one of these people too. Um, there's just, there's, they're, they're so fucking obnoxious. The fear is not necessarily harmful, it's just foolish. So I don't want to complain about it because I want to spend every single second on the harmful stuff. But it's so baffling that these people see a fascist and a Nazi or a fascist sympathizer and a Nazi sympathizer under every fucking rock that they lift. I've got a blog post in the works for this, so I'll explain why it's actually paranoid um, in greater depth in that blog post. But for now, I'll just point out that it's every bit as annoying as the conservative who sees a Marxist under every rock they lift. Right? It always comes down to this slippery slope horseshit that masquerades as insightful commentary. But all it is, is a slippery fucking slope. Socialism does not march in lockstep with Stalinism or Maoism or any other cult of personality man-ism. It doesn't have to. It's workers seizing the means of production. Cooperation at the workplace, democracy at the workplace, you can still have bosses, you just can't have owners. There's still a hierarchical structure. It's just everyone who is on the part of that hierarchy would be, um, would be a non-owner and a worker. No need for Stalinism, no need for Maoism, no need for any cult of personality philosophy. And so, so people will understand that. Like usually my average viewer will probably understand that, right? They'll understand why cultural Marxism is a boogie word. But they might be all too happy to ascribe Nazism and fascism much in the same slippery slope way as people will throw around Marxism. Now we have to stop doing this. For the sake of epistemic progress, we have to stop this slippery slope horseshit can we do that pretty please if we can't i'm bowing out of political discourse i bowed out of it more or less but i'm gonna bow out of it even harder because it's so boring political discourse is slippery slope discourse these days i don't see how you can't find that infuriating. If you don't find it insufferable, we are not the same species. And that's all I'm gonna say. So this is probably the most mixed bag video I've done in ages. I don't think I've had a mixed bag video this mixy since the old by the ways. But it felt good. I got a few things off my chest. Hopefully the construction wasn't too obnoxious. I actually think that they stopped. Well, what do you know? Maybe pressing the record button is a good luck charm. The rain didn't stop, so you still gonna have to put up with the rain hitting my window pane. Um, but that's a, that's a small price to pay. Uh, but yes, uh, hopefully uh, you'll check out those other videos I've done on the other channel. And uh, let me know if uh, you're subscribed to that channel, but if the videos are not popping up in your feed because they sure as fuck didn't pop up on my feed. And uh, was that it? 44 minutes, yeah, I think that's, I think I've done enough damage.